So I want to welcome you all to the Center for Advanced Study in Behavioral Sciences, known as CASBIS. And I'm Margaret Levy, the Sarah Miller McCune Director here. Um, and I also want to welcome the live stream audience. This is the third of our symposia this year. And we also uh, recently had the SAGE CASBIS lecture with Carol Dweck. All of them were amazing. We'll see how this goes. Um, and you can, watch, you can watch videos of them, um, either through our website or through our excellent newsletter, which you can also get through the website. So do check out the website for CASBIS and learn all about us if you don't already know about us. This is also a very special symposium because every year we honor the former associate director, Robert A. Scott, Bob, um, with one of our events in, in his name. When he turned 80 years old, which he now admits that he did turn 80 years old, um, there was a, a campaign by a number of former fellows, I among them, um, who had loved and so appreciated working with Bob through the very many years that he was the associate director. It was 1983 to 2001, and then he came back for two years after that to help smooth some operations <laughs> that were going on. Um, I'm not going to spend time introducing everybody because uh, you have material about everyone. We do have a, a former communication, a former. Uh, a former president of a country, a, a communications professor, former, yeah. and someone who actually does communications uh, on NBC and in other places. So hopefully you will enjoy our discussion tonight. Um, can I turn it up? Now you can talk, okay, Jake. Okay, now I'll talk. Now I'll talk. Thank <laughs> you. Um, so yes, welcome everybody. I will just briefly introduce everybody just in case you did not look at the backgrounder. So Tom Ilvis uh, is the former president of Estonia. He digitized uh, democracy in that country. You can currently pay your taxes in under five minutes on your phone, thanks to Tom, uh, which is a, uh, just shows what a racket it is uh, paying taxes here in this country. Um, uh, we were just rolling our eyes together at that today. Mike Anony uh, is associate professor of communication at USC. Um, and uh, uh, wrote uh, Networked Press Freedom, uh, a book about not just sort of my right as a journalist to, to speak openly, but your right to hear in a more sophisticated way, way than you're often allowed. Um, and Margaret, you all know, but, but I'll just say, because some of you may not know, um, that on March 27th, she was named the 25th laureate of um, the Johann uh, Schutte Prize, which is for anyone who doesn't know their international academic honors, is basically the Nobel Prize of political science. And so we are all very proud of her. So let's applaud her for a second. I forgot to say one thing I have to Please, say. Please, go ahead. These three are fellows uh, that are sponsored by the Bergrun Institute. And I'm very grateful, as we all are, to the Bergrun Institute, which has been sponsoring five fellows a year. Um, next year will be the fifth year. This was the fourth class. Um, and I th is Dawn, are you here? Not yet. But Dawn Nakagawa, who is the vice president, one of the vice presidents of the Bergruen Institute, will be joining us later. And if you happen to meet her, please thank her on the behalf yep. of the center. That's right. That's right. Um, and I'll just say, I'm Jake Ward. I am a, I'm a technology correspondent for NBC News. I'm here to write a book as a CASBIS fellow this year about uh, the human effects of technology and AI in particular. So anyway, this has been a really amazing year for me. I think it has for everybody. And so I'll just start by letting each of us kind of uh, give a little uh, summary of, of you know, the things we've been thinking about this year, some of the, the themes we keep coming back to and thinking about democracy and the digital age. So Tom, we'll start with you. And I'm, and I'm going to cut you off under t at, at 10 minutes. So uh, I was supposed to go last. Well, I'm going okay. to make you go first this time. <laughs> okay. Well, I think everyone here, uh, anyone who reads the newspapers, knows that we are in a uh, a new a new environment where let's see if I do this uh, a new environment in which we see all for all kinds of manipulations of democracy, of electoral democracy, of public opinion, and that th these, are, uh, these are methods that we really don't quite understand yet. And in fact, as uh, recently as 
two years ago, there was considerable doubt that these things, these things such as that we have seen in terms of dark ads, fake news, if you can use that term anymore, uh, <clears throat> bots, most people had no idea what a bot was two years ago. Um, hacking people knew about, uh, but uh, not much more than that. And <clears throat> we have now, we have entered an era in which we are highly vulnerable to manipulations of democracy as we have known it. There's a number of simple mechanisms that have been used. Uh, well, hacking is probably the one that we all know, but it was, um, I mean, hacking is something that has been going on since the 70s, breaking into people's computers. It became, became political with one act, which is called doxing, which is, comes from the word documents, which we saw with the WikiLeaks, uh, uh, WikiLeaks documents being posted in, during the, or after the Iraq war, but that was to shame the U.S. government. It had not been used, or this method had not been used for political gain until 2016, in which the servers of the Democratic National Committee uh, and <clears throat> were hacked by foreign, a foreign power. Um, and then not only were they hacked, but they were, the, the contents of the server were published. And of course, all of media went along with it. Um, we're far from the era of sort of the, sort of the idea of the purloined letter, something that you don't, really, you don't, gentlemen don't read other people's correspondence. If you think about Watergate, there is no way in 1974, even if they had succeeded, that a newspaper would have started publishing the contents of, a, of stolen material from the Democratic National Committee. Right. In 2016, this became, it became a race to the bottom. Mm -hmm. So that's doxing and publication. From there on, we can look at the whole use of fake news. Uh, again, where media was highly, uh, Naive at the beginning, you can date really to its m massive use to 2014, when um, when uh, at an on an industrial scale, uh, false narratives were presented uh, on the originally the Ukraine Russia war. Uh, that again was new. This is again something that is enabled by technology that before in the past there were yes they've been fake news ever since. Uh, the Achaeans came came with their horse to Troy, but uh, but it didn't really uh, get around that much. Um, or you can look at more famously, you know, the fake story about the CIA developing AIDS, which it took about six months for that even to make it into the Europe from where it was planted. Today, these things are instantaneous. Um, then, what is also new in this era of technology is uh, <clears throat> the use of highly targeted, uh, or the big data and its use in targeting advertising. Highly granular advertising, so that which you saw already in the 2016 uh, election where thanks to Cambridge Analytica, which had managed to get the full profiles of 87 million people on Facebook, managed to send to whoever they want, to whomever they wanted to send a message, highly targeted ads, unregulated, unlike sort of the kinds of regulations you have for broadcast media, there was no regulation whatsoever, that's changed somewhat. Um, and now we're moving into an era where the next threat is considered to be what is called um, deep, th deep fakes, uh, which is, if you want to think about it, deep fake, it's Photoshopped movies. Uh, I mean, Photoshopping has been around even before the existence of the digital era, but now you can actually make people say things, do things that on I mean, sort of in video that they have never done, and you can find some great examples of that if you uh, sort of type in Ob <clears throat> But Obama and deep fakes, and you'll see uh, Barack Obama saying things he's never said uh, in his voice. So these are these are the threats that we see coming. And of course, there have been all kinds of ways ways of dealing with this. Some of this. How much time do I have? Oh, you're doing good. I'd say give it another minute. Another minute. Or so. I have legislative means and so forth. 
uh, to regulate these things. My position, which is actually what I want to talk about, is that I think we've gotten to the point where technological solutions are, uh, are not enough. And we have to look again at uh, what, uh, how to preserve democracies and attack or, or at least make democracies more resilient uh, that the vulnerabilities of democracy are the things that we should start worrying about, not simply regulating Facebook. Mm -hmm. uh, and those vulnerabilities, briefly, I would say, most importantly, probably, in the Anglo-Saxon world, the use of first-past-the-post election systems, which is a winner-take-all approach, almost inevitably leads to two-party systems to, where the two parties become more radical. The winner-take-all approach is even more fed by, by social media than it has in the past. Europe is a little better off in this. We, in most countries uh, uh, outside of England or the UK, uh, and with the exception notably, I would say, of Hungary, um, which also uses the first-past-the-post system, that you multiple mandate elect, electoral districts lead to generally coalition governments, a need to compromise. Uh, I think that um, perhaps uh, to stir things up, I, say I think that any kind of disproportionality uh, in democracies is highly vulnerable, especially combined with uh, first-past-the-post systems, which leads to the electoral college really is a, is a really dangerous thing. Uh, and Katie J Holmes Jameson has actually written a book called Cyber War about how targeting key states in 2016 with uh, a higher percentage or a greater weight in the Electoral College was where she noticed the greatest amount of activity on, mani on digital manipulation. Um, I think that this also has uh, implications for referenda, which are clearly bi binary choices. Once again, yes, no, and uh, Brexit, where we saw uh, on the Leave side the a massive expenditure on digital media, and you know, I mean some on the tradition on traditional media, but it was really heavily focused with a lot of lies, me fake memes. All these things were were I mean huge amounts of money were put into the Leave side, which is now coming under investigation. Certainly, uh, much later than in the United States regarding 2016, but that's happening. And ultimately, I think we may get to the point where we have to also look at anonymity as a threat to democracy. Um, not in criminal terms, but certainly as we know from the experience of doxing individuals in this country, including the woman who testified against in the Kavanaugh case, uh, which is now in her fourth, she's living in the fourth place since she this announcement came out uh, eight months ago. She has to move all the time. Uh, and that's all done anonymously. Someone posts her address. Until we get to the point where yeah. you become liable, uh, at least for civil judgments, on uh, exposing, doing this kind of thing anonymously, we will see this being abused and abused and abused. That's great. Let me, let me stop you there, because we got so much more to talk about. Mike, you want to go next? You tell us about it. We'll, we'll, end up, we'll wind up with Margaret. Go ahead. Sure, yeah, OK. Thanks very much. Um, I went, just because I'm wearing a tie, I went a little more formal and actually wrote out some <laughs> remarks, but I'm the, the only one with a tie. Um, I just, it's a total treat to be here, to have this conversation with the CASBIS community, with you all. Um, and I wanted to briefly set the scene for how I think about the intersections that are at the heart of this evening's topic, digital media, public life democratic self-governance. And specifically, I want to offer some brief thoughts on what platforms are, uh, the scale they operate at, and why platforms matter. Um, and as background, I'm a professor of communication and journalism, which means I think at its core that I, I study how people make meaning through media. Now, this is broad, but the focus on meaning and media sort of it sets a specific intellectual challenge, but it also immediately puts us in relation to fields of practice. So practice like journalism and technology design as two fields of practice. And by making meaning through media, what I mean is this. It's how people who are never going to meet face to face, how they have to discover and contest and manage collective life 
and the stakes of being basically stuck in collectives that you didn't necessarily choose to join, but you've got to figure out how to manage. So that's how people make publics through communication. And we know this because publics are not naturally occurring phenomena. They don't exist in the wild. We don't go out into the world and just find them. We make public life through actions and structures that are intertwined with media. So what we choose to watch or to post or to read online, but also what's available to us. Uh, what stories journalists choose to tell, but also the stories that they're incentivized to tell. Um, what speech and ideas advertising markets reward and make more likely, more likely to surface. How regulations govern speech or see a media monopoly or don't see a media monopoly and see political communication. I could go on, the examples um, are, are endless, but the point is this, it's that how well we govern ourselves how we know each other, how we discover our shared concerns, or how we sanction behavior, all of this governance depends on how well our communication systems are working. They're sort of at the core of that governance. But today, these systems of communication, I want to argue, these are sort of systems of self-governance that make publics, that make us cohere into publics, these are increasingly living within privately controlled infrastructures. And these are the infrastructures that create the conditions under which people make meaning. So some publics get to happen, some publics don't get to happen. That's, it's tied in with their infrastructure. So these infrastructures are called platforms mostly today. That's sort of the word that's often used. And platform makers will often argue that they don't create information at all, that they're neutral. They're just sort of common carriers that exist. But we know though that they make important decisions about how information's gathered, circulated, analyzed, sold, and we know that they make images of the world with our information. They tell us the world that we're living in with our information. Uh, following uh, Josie Van Dyck and colleagues, I, I want to say that we can distinguish between two kinds of platforms. Uh, the first is what they call sectoral platforms. So think Airbnb, Spotify, Netflix, Lyft. These are platforms that connect people who have something with people who want something, okay? They're typically focused in domains like housing or transportation or entertainment or news. But there's a second and more powerful type of platform that I think I wanna focus on uh, tonight. And these are called infrastructural platforms. And these are platforms that make this invisible, often invisible web through which almost all of our data flow today. All of our data are captured, processed, stored, circulated, and sold. And we typically think of them in terms of the big five technology companies, right? So this is Microsoft, Apple, Google, Facebook, Amazon that control the vast amount of data, how it flows today. Um, and these are most obviously things like search engines, browsers, email clients, advertising markets, social networking sites, uh, your GPS system maybe that you use to get here tonight. Uh, but importantly, they also make and apply rules about what content is allowed to exist online and circulate online. And they, to do that, they direct a vast global workforce of contractors, people not living in this country, and a vast global network of proprietary algorithms that mon moderate speech. They're creating their very own Supreme Courts to adjudicate ap appeals, mm -hmm. calling, them, calling them Supreme Courts. Uh, they're setting up their own ethics boards. They sometimes talk about themselves as governments, and indeed the government of Denmark has an official ambassador of technology. Mm -hmm. um, I could go on, but the point is they're building this complete stack of experience through custom hardware, software, server farms, data warehouses, private internet networks, undersea cables, entire neighborhoods, so historians, I, I often say, think about, don't think about Joseph Pulitzer as the historical canonical, think about George Pullman and Pullman towns that are sort of spreading across the world. So the scope and scale of these platforms is unprecedented. It's moving faster than governments and civil society can move. And I think it's also often sort of outstripping the very idea of governance sometimes. So we're continually caught in this moment of anticipating and reacting, imagining what changes these companies might bring, but also trying to sort of cope with what they've made. And we're trying to figure out whether we need to simply apply existing models of oversight or to invent entirely brand new ones. So in trying to understand public life in platform societies, I think there's two urgent questions that maybe we can, we can get into in the Q&A a little more. But the first is what kind of governance of these systems is even possible at all? What can us as outsiders, or as, as customers, as governments alike, what can we actually even know about these systems and how they work? And how can we even know what we don't know? Which is the, the critical second point. 
The second sort of area I think to, to think about and talk about is what values and principles should drive the public governance of these systems? So as Thomas sort of alluded to, categories like public and private speech or personal versus collective, these are categories that I think are sort of newly up for debate in ways um, they weren't necessarily before. Because these systems, they're simultaneously post offices and broadcasters and kind of everything in between. We need some new language to describe them. So how do things like trust, harm, press freedom, accountability, witnessing, how do they exist in a platform society? And to, to wrap up, notice that I haven't asked, I have not asked what is the impact of technology on society? I, I think that's the wrong question. These platforms are societies of intertwined people and machines. So there's no such thing as online life and real life. And I think we give massive ground if we pretend that tech power is somehow separate from society or that these companies are simply having an effect or an impact on something distinct called society um, or that we have the meaningful choice to participate in that. So those of us who care about public governance, I think, need to better understand and challenge the power of these private infrastructures. I think self-regulation is proving insufficient. Um, and even recent calls by platforms for more regulation themselves, I think those need to be viewed skeptically. I understand, for Facebook, for instance, why it would be certainly be easier for them to apply global speech standards rather than fuss around with different jurisdictions and cultures, um, but I, I feel strongly that their desire for simplicity and optimization can't be allowed to collapse human differences. So we need to lead with public principles grounded in democratic legitimacy and public accountability, um, not letting them define the terms. So, so, and what I mean here is that flawed as they are, we have courts already. We have parliaments already. We have elections already. We have civil societies. We have traditions of democratic legitimacy and accountability. And platforms need us. They need our content, they need our labor, they need our attention, they need our money, and they are ours to control if we can figure out how to do it. Mm -hmm. That's great. So I'll stop there. Great. Margaret? So this follows very nicely because I really want to focus on a couple of questions. Um, the first is what constitutes democratic governance in the world that we live in that is the world you two have described? And the second question really has to do with how do we build what my co-author John Alquist and I call expanded communities of fate, F-A-T-E, not faith, fate. Um, how do we build worlds in which we really are building publics that feel that they're, what, what each does is intertwined with others in ways that they take real moral and ethical responsibility for each other? And I think that the, the new technologies help us, can help us in both regards. They're also endangering both things, but I wanna focus on some of the positive and then think about the issues that we have to bring to bear in thinking those through more carefully. So what I wanna do is talk about a couple of experiments, and I think these experiments are fantastic, and they show a huge amount of imagination. They're experiments largely coming from technologists who are trying to deal with exactly the kinds of questions that I've just put on the table. Um, but we're gonna see that imagination may not be enough, <laughs> that we also have to worry about things like legitimacy, accountability, responsibility, an anonymity as a possible vulnerability, um, exactly the kinds of things that have been laid on the table. So the first set of um, of experiments that I want to mention really have to do with using platforms to create societal collaborations. And I notice that Mako Hill is here, and so I feel a little guilty about talking about this at all because he's one of the great creators of this who does think about exactly the issues I'm talking about and could talk to this issue much more better than I could. So when they ask questions of me, we'll send them to Mako. Yeah, well, that's right. Um, but I'm gonna talk also about, so these platforms to create uh, societal collaborations include a number of things, from things like Move On and Get Up, which is the Australian version of Move On. So using various kinds of digital technologies to allow people to express preferences and voice in ways they might not have, and sign petitions and do other things that they might not have done before. Those have proved very limited and somewhat irritating those of us who got too many of their emails too often. Mm. Um, another experiment that I think is really exciting is Code for America, 
uh, which is really working hard to figure out how to use technology and teams of people to solve governmental problems, delivery of services to people, to, to deal with injustices that have to do with having to wait in line, in multiple lines during your workday in order to get your um, record cleared of driving problems um, in order to get the job that you want to get. And you can use up days of standing in line and engaging in paperwork. Thomas and Estonia solved many of those problems. Code for America is trying its best to solve some of them from the bottom up, um, since we don't have a government that seems to be doing that, um, rather than top down. And I really recommend those of you who don't know that organization to look at it. But it's not really, it's building a little bit of societal collaboration, but not a lot. It's solving particular problems. Another um, experiment uh, is something that is being done by a collaborator of John Seeley Brown, who's in this audience, and me. Um, we've been working and thinking about how various societal collaborations can be built by platforms. And David Lee, who is part of Tech for Good Lab at Santa University of Santa Cruz, who is like Mako, been trying to build various kinds of platforms that really engage people in new ways, build micro hierarchies that share expertise, and that bring in people who don't know each other to begin to build something of a community of fate, and who have some democratic responsibility built into the system so that they can begin. But these are just experiments that have not yet been scaled to deal with real world problems, at least David Lee's have not. Um, so that's one kind of uh, experiment that's going on. Another, uh, and I'll mention again some names, Michael Bernstein and his lab in computer science here at Stanford has been engaging in all kinds of experiments to give workers some capacity to express grievances, who, workers who are in the gig economy and who don't know each other, don't have a water cooler, don't have a clear boss uh, because they're hired by us to drive them but in fact, it's all controlled by a platform that's making a profit off of our relationship, our, us and the driver, or us and whoever. Um, and so he's trying to figure out how to use technology to give people some way to express, the workers themselves, some ways to express what's going on and what the problems are. I started working with him to do, go beyond that and actually try to figure out not how you can just express grievances, but how you could build an alternative hiring hall, a new form of hiring hall, a way in which the workers would actually control the critical piece of information that an employer needs from them, whether it's an Amazon Turk employer or an Upwork employer. Um, so someone is coming and looking to figure out whether Bob Scott can actually do the work he says he can do and is actually good at it. And what do we use? We use these silly rating systems of one to five, and everybody gets a four or a five because we know they'll be fired if they get less than that. Mm -hmm. and we don't want to be responsible for that if we're good people. So we give them all a four or five. There's no way to differentiate. But if the workers controlled that information and the, the employers had to come to them and say, I need a really good electrician, I really need a really good web designer, whatever it is, and they would be able to figure out a way to determine among them and distribute work and maybe do some training. So to create something approaching a union, uh, a new form of unionization, whether you call it a union or not. And that leads me to another kind of experiment, which is really around our data. So one of the things I've been learning about lately, and still only have a little bit of knowledge about, I pressed Jake to tell me more if he knew. And, he doesn't yet, but maybe he can bring more to bear on this. But there are a number of experiments on what are called data unions. And what those are are really representing collectivities of workers um, whose data is being sold or being used in some way or another and ensuring that those workers, and those, uh, con those, use those providers of data, sorry, the consumers who are providing data, um, actually have protections, if that's what they want, for privacy and security, but also get some of the benefit of the surplus value that is being created 
by their data. So for example, the American um, Airlines workers were recently given free Wi-Fi by the company, and they realized that, that the data that they were producing when they used the Wi-Fi was being sold, right, for commercial purposes. So they turned to a data union to help them get some control over those profits. Okay, so there's another kind of experiment, and they're, they're going on in the US, there's a data union in the US, and there's a series of data unions in Europe, and what's interesting and not surprising about them is that the ones in the US tend to rely on litigation, and the ones in Europe tend to rely on creating laws. You might probably know about some of these, Thomas. Not that much, but... Yeah, they're just beginning, it's a, it's a really interesting set of experiments. The third set of experiments I want to mention, I have a few more minutes, right? Cool, please, you're my boss. Uh, well, no, you can stop me anytime. And your other boss came in, Dawn, yeah. we thanked you That's earlier. Right. <laughs> um, it has to do with block the blockchain and voting um, experiments that are going on using blockchain. And a variety of these experiments talk about creating liquid democracy. And it's basically, from what I can understand, um, a form of giving people a way to vote, not just up or down on an issue, not just the Democrats or the Republicans or one party versus another party, but to actually express their preferences on particular issues. And the way this tends to work is you have not just one vote, you have a series of chits, which you can then, so there's a kind of a quadratic voting as part of this Glenn Wiles idea. Um, and you can, you, you use these chits in com combination with others, sometimes through an intermediary, if that's what you want to do, sometimes just on your own or with a group of friends, to express preferences. You have a limited number of chits and you can use them, distribute them as you choose to. And that's a way to give people incredibly greater voice and greater engagement in some of the things that they care about. Santiago Siri and democracy.earth are experimenting like crazy with this and have even created a party in Argentina that's based around these principles. Um, Radical Exchange, started by Glenn Weil, the co-author of Radical Markets, um, is absorbing a lot of these groups and trying to understand some of these experiments. It's a bit of an umbrella. One of the more interesting ideas that I heard uh, discussed at a recent radical exchange meeting that I went to was the idea of creating a third party or an alternative party, depending on the country that you live in, that would only become a party once it crossed the threshold to become a party. So it'd be totally private and secret until enough votes and, and algorithms can do that. There's a way to create that in the blockchain to do that. So there's some amazing experiments going on, but there are problems with them. And I think we have to be alert to the fact that these are experiments we should pay attention to and encourage, but also that we have to be wary of, not just for the technical reasons, which there's lots of material about how are they adequately protecting security, privacy, blah, blah. Um, but they're not always raising some of the fundamental issues about democracy and about creating publics and communities yeah. of faith. Mm -hmm. So one of the things I've noticed in a lot of these is that they're, they, are, they are subject to what I would call a tyranny of ideology, a particular ideology, which focuses on decentralized government, antipathy to central government, a way to give voice to everyone all the time, and really doesn't like representative democracy. And I think there's some things to be learned from that and from these experiments, but I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. What these experiments tend not to acknowledge sufficiently is that there's a certain value to some <coughs> deliberative process and some open discussion, not just an expression of immediate preference, even if it's a thoughtful preference. You don't want to just be empowering a passionate minority um, or allow what we, the Constitution in the US and in most democracies worry about is a tyranny of the majority, just because that's what they want right now. So we need to have some mediating structures. That's what pol politics and political institutions, as we think about modern democracies, bring to bear. Um, we also 
the other tyranny of, in this ideology is against government, and I hope we don't forget that governments can play a very important role, not just governance of the platforms that we're talking about, but they are the providers of a whole series of services. They are the coordinators of a whole variety of ways in which we can act together positively as a larger community of faith. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So, all right, let me, let me start by just sort of trying to set the scene a little bit for, just think about the context in which we are operating. So right now, when I, when I was trying to articulate to my bosses during my job interviews at, at NBC News what I would be covering here, one thing I kept getting asked was, People in technology tend to believe they are changing the world for the better. They get hired for that reason. That's the thing that gets talked about. It's a constant theme within the companies. But incredibly destructive stuff is happening that no one seems to be able to grapple with. I guess I'll throw this to anybody, but I'll start with you, Margaret. You know, is there, do you think, a... I think people within a lot of these companies would argue it is just a matter of learning the right lessons, doing the right experiments, and we can arrive at an equitable society that, that you know, removes all the inefficiencies of life. Do you believe that's possible, or do we have to impose somehow you know, limits, for lack of a better word? I mean, you're talking about data unions and so forth that, that r remove value from the company, limit their influence and their value. Do we have to impose that, do you think? Or is there a way for companies, as I think they would argue, to learn enough to make the world right? So part of, part of uh, what I represent here is, um, as someone who's done a lot of historical work in comparative political economy, and I have yet to see a company survive in the ecosystem of companies that do that. I right. mean, I think there are certainly entrepreneurs, there are certainly people in a company who care about those things and value those things, but I wouldn't rest on just the companies to do that. They are, have multiple motivations. Mm -hmm. And with the tech companies, it's not just the profit motivation, but it's also the incredible they're enamored, as they need to be, for the, what they're doing with what technology can produce. And um, in its, its capacity to make things, not only the, the neatest, coolest product, which they believe makes us better off, and which uh, one of our projects here, Roberta's involved with that, and there may be others in the audience here who are, has been really thinking about the impact of these technologies on young people. Mm -hmm. Um, and the way in which they are affecting their values, their interactions, their <coughs> politics, a whole variety of things. So the coolest, neatest products, yes, they can be great, but they can also have all kinds of deleterious right. effects. Right. And I don't think the companies are the people capable of, one, regulating themselves mm -hmm. around those things, or even understanding, because they're companies based on technologies, yeah. not on the societal and et consequences and ethical implications of what they do right. on the consequences of that. Yeah, t I mean, Tom, sorry, let me throw it out, Tom, okay. just because uh, I know that you, you have described, you are a self-described form, you know, reformed techno-utopian. You were, you came up as an engineer. That is your educational well, background. Well, not quite, but. Well, but, you know, but yeah, you're, you enough. were in that world where, <laughs> yeah. I mean, you and I both were sort of, we believed there was a way for technology to make life better. Yeah. Well, I, I still do. However, I think that we have been insufficiently uh, aware of the abuse and really major abuse. I'll bring some cases. Number one, I mean, everyone in 2011 was talking about, okay, social media, this is going to bring real democracy to authoritarian countries right. and Tahrir Square, and this is where civil society gets up. That, it was true, yeah. On the other hand, then there were a bunch of people, or not, maybe not so many people, but at least one or two countries or three countries that said, hmm, if, um, if civil society can do this without the resources of the state, think of what we can do yeah. with the resources of the state put into disrupting countries elsewhere. And trust me, <laughs> the Russian government, the Iranian government, the Chinese government, they're all much better at doing this thing than you know, a couple of hundred thousand people in Tahrir Square. Mm. Uh, so that's one issue is that right. people did not think about the possibility for sort of pushing for all kinds of changes um, when behind it is a government. 
uh, as a, and so the the optimism of Tahrir Square is is um, well, I think it's uh, was misplaced. Mm-hmm. Secondly, there's this general tendency toward what um, Evgeny Morozov calls solutionism, which is that there's always a technical technological yeah. solution, and we can solve this problem. Just right. give it. We can make this better. And uh, maybe not. And uh, that in fact. Uh, I mean, that's really the basis of what I was saying earlier, is that, in fact, there, there may, we may have to do things in the analog world to make sure that we are not, in fact, um, that we can ameliorate or mitigate the dangers of technology. And third of all, of course, you can really go extreme. And if you know the next year in the People's Republic of China, they will be instituting the social credit model on a mandatory basis, which basically keeps track of people. Uh, and everything you do and everything you say and everywhere you are, um, which is ultimately not that different from what is potentially in the hands of Facebook and Twitter right. uh, and, and Google, which knows always where you are because you're carrying around your phone. It's just it has not been brought into one place and used for, uh, for to create a larger machine that does this, but that's, that possibility is always there. Um, so technological solutions can really be used uh, toward ends that are uh, fundamentally non-democratic, yeah. uh, that are not in the interests of uh, liberal democracy, as we at least tend to understand it in uh, what we call the liberal democratic world. You know, sort of. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, what do you got? What's yeah. Um, <laughs> thanks. Sorry. TV producer. Sorry, 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 sorry. <laughs> no, 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 that's right. why, that's why story. I have this job. Right. Yeah. What do you got? What do you got? What do you got? Well, I, I actually think hidden in the question that I think your your bosses are asking you about this, you know, changing the world, is not this, this boss. Sorry, no, no, no. no, no. <laughs> other bosses. Other yeah. bosses. Uh, this question about changing the world is, I, why is the world our scale of effect? Why? Uh, why is why is that scale the one that all whole bunch of people, mostly technologists, are trying to operate at? Yeah. I think there's. And that plays out in venture capital funding. That plays out in the you know big data and the ability to create better, faster predictions given more data. But there's this assumption of scale that I think is built into the right. core logics. And those assumptions of scale don't necessarily map on well to the history of how we've figured out scales of governance. Mm. I mean, we we had city states, we had the Westphalian right. state, we had the EU as a as a model that was right. We've had we've had different experiments with what scales of governance are yeah. like. And we've had think about you know Dunbar's number as this sort of societal scale of like what is the right set of human relations to be in regard to at any given moment. That's not. I'm not saying that's a settled matter by any scale, by any sense. Um, but I think the idea that we need to, you know, technologists need to change the world. Yeah, and right. That, that is that should be slide one in your pitch to the people up at Sand Hill Road. Yeah, that's concerning. That's yeah. right. So I think we also need to think about the kinds of forces and incentive structures. Could could I get a bunch of funding for doing something not at large scale? Right. Like if I was explicitly not changing the world, right? And the answer is no. Probably it'd be harder. Right. I don't know if the answer is no, but I mean, it'd be much a, harder, a, right? I think a, a, um, an investor would say, "Yeah, no thanks. I, I want the 10x version. Yeah, I don't want the, yeah. the city-state size." That's right. really right. so. There's a bunch of rhetoric around changing yeah. the world that I think we need to really question and put into service of a lot of the learning we've already done mm-hmm. about how governance works at different scales. Do you, and I'll throw this to any of the three of you, I mean, what do you think is, so one of the things that's been so fascinating for me about being at Casbis is every time I, I bump into something in reporting out the book I'm writing, you know, or the work that I do for NBC, you know, it's something about, oh, here is this fundamental human tendency that, these, that this or that piece of technology seems to have bumped into um, can anyone tell me anything about that? And then it turns out, you know, there's 75 years of scholarship on it. Uh, there's a whole name for the field that I didn't even know. You know, to you guys, I mean, what what is the sort of, what are the major gaps in our knowledge of ourselves, I guess, or of our structures as people that, that you think need to get weaved into whatever the improved version of a digitally driven democracy is going to be? You know, what do people need to be studying in school or whatever it is? That, that changed it, Just studying in school. But what we could study here and academics can study and others is, and I think the recent, the, the issues you were raising about Russia and China and Iran potentially manipulating elections is that we don't, 
really know, we know a lot, but not enough about how beliefs are formed and how they change and how mm. people are persuaded and manipulated. And we do know quite a bit, but we don't know enough. And it, in that sense, and we also don't totally understand these new tools for, for transforming us. Mm. So I think that's a big area that really has to be explored. And I think we need to take it on much more seriously and treat what's happened as a challenge, not just as an awful thing, but as a challenge to improve our capacity, our social science capacity. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I, oh, go so ahead. Go. You go. No, I'll jump with one really brief one that actually I've been working on and thinking about a lot this year, but it's sort of questioning this notion of connection as uh, an inherent good. And I think that there's a lot of, there's a lot of history and there's a lot of value in thinking about about disconnection, about mm -hmm. absences, about silences, mm -hmm. about moments when we're not actually creating, and, and the tech companies love connections because it gives you a data trail, yeah. right? I mean, it's, so the absence of a data trail is considered to be a bad thing. Right. So built through another logic sitting beside scale is connection, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the one that is kind of like an unquestioned good. But I think a lot of our studies of, of humans and social behavior, we know there's lots of moments when actually disconnection mm -hmm. and I Solitude, solitude is different from boredom. isolation. Boredom, right. right? These are sort of part of the human fabric of experience that we can't just put into service yeah. of a data. But don't we also want to parse connection? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah. you know, some connections have that very. They're just their data trail, and yeah. other connections are deep and solid and can produce the kinds of communities and democracies yeah. that we want. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Go ahead, Tom. I just. Tr ran through this real quick because it's a long thing I'm writing. But uh, basically, next this next month will be the 60th anniversary of a classic uh, essay written by C.P. Snow called "The Two Cultures." It's a it's an essay about the university, and he talks about well, he was he he was one of those who bridged the two cultures. He was a physical chemist who was also a literary novelist who gave us the term "the corridors of power," for example, the title of one of his novels. And this essay in 1959 was basically talking about how the, you know, the scientists couldn't care less about what the literary people were doing, and the literary people had no clue about what the scientists were doing. And he said, this is a problem, which it was. And it caused a minor, minor kind of upheaval in the early 60s with F.R. Levis writing nasty articles and stuff. My, I, my position is that, we, that he wrote an essay about the problem of the university. It is the problem of the world today. Mm -hmm. When he wrote that essay, the telephone was something that was plugged in the wall and you left and it didn't know where you were today. That's not true. <laughs> um, and your, the, the, the Orwellian television that looked at you was considered an impossibility and every single laptop today can look at you and it can be hacked to look at you. And anyone who, you know, be, it's interesting to ask people, how do you know that, you know, where all those cars, are, where the traffic jam is up ahead when you're using your GPS, right? I mean, how do they know? Gee, someone knows. Mm -hmm. we, I mean, we have become, technology has become such an integral part of how we do everything, whereas in 1959, I mean, about as technological as you got as a human being was probably adjusting the timing on your distributor cap, and no one knows what a distributor cap is anymore, um, right. under a certain age here. Right, right. Um, <laughs> And so I would say that but we, we have not dealt with this. And we have, so we have these solutionist techno, technologists who with a minimal understanding of the academic research, but even some of the fundamental ethical issues. Yeah, I mean, there have been some pretty unethical things that have been done as, quote, experiments by social media, manipulating this or that, that were they to be presented as always has to be done in a social science department, psychology department, would never pass the ethics committee. Because there is no ethics yeah, committee right. that says, you can't do that. Yeah, right. Um, right, right. And so you see these, now we are in, in a two culture world that, and that, is, that is far bigger than Cambridge, the, you know, the dining hall of a Cambridge University college, which was, it was when uh, C.P. Snow wrote his essay. Yeah. So we, we had a, a uh, you know, as everyone knows, we have a, a seminar here uh, once, sometimes twice a week, and each of the fellows presents their work. And we had one uh, from the fellow uh, Bart Bonikowski who was doing uh, 
a really interesting survey of, of sort of the playbook of, of nationalist politics and the rise of all of these uh, uh, political figures who were running on the basis of it. He, uh, he had the most wonderful slide of, of Trump and Le Pen and all these different people, and they all have the same haircut. They all have the same weird flip. It's a, it was a, an amazing moment for me. But, uh, but uh, he, I, we were all, all talking about it. He was sort of saying that they back into their playbook, that it feels coordinated, but in fact, it's just a sort of backing into the politics of fear, that it's happening sort of by happenstance in a way. It's not some grand conspiracy yet. And I guess what I would love to know from each of you is, as people begin to get their act together, as they begin to understand the power of these platforms, understand uh, the frailties of, of you know, human psychology and the human political structure and the rest of it, what should we, because I know each of you studies sort of a, a different slice of this, what should we as a society be getting ready for uh, in, the, in the coming years as, as people get better and better at this stuff? It's a dark question, I know. Who wants to go first? Tom, come on. I already went first. I don't want to go yeah, first. Yeah, I know, I know. What do you think, Margaret? I mean, I'll throw one out there, just to yeah, sort of set the stage. Start. I'll throw one out there. So for me, the theme of, of the book that I'm looking at is, is uh, the book I'm writing is, is there is a, I think, a fundamental allergy in human beings to understanding that there are patterns that connect us all. And what we don't understand, you know, everyone likes to imagine that they are unique, their experience is unique, their tendencies are unique. Um, but in fact, as we're learning from, for instance, the lookalike modeling uh, that Facebook does, they can create a simulation of you, match it to simulations they've, considered, they've created of everybody else, and by doing that comparison, perfectly predict what you're gonna do next and what your interests are, which is, which is what leads everybody to thinking that their phone is listening to their actual conversation, and maybe it is actually listening to your conversation, but the truth is they don't have to do that to get out in front of what you're gonna do next. The reason that the ads start coming up for the car because you and your spouse were just talking about a car <clears throat> is just because you're like everybody else who was talking about a car at that time in their life and they can make that prediction. So for me, I feel like just getting people to understand there are patterns to our behavior you know, that, that no one is immune to, that apply to all of us. That for me is like one of the fundamental things. That's what I'm hoping to sort of get across on a national medium. That's what, you know, I'm, I'm literally marching through stories right now that try to say, you have patterns to your behavior in how you listen to music, in the restaurants you go to, uh, in how you talk to your, uh, uh, the, the, spouse you just divorced. There's a whole category of companies that's trying to guide conversations between divorced parents to keep them from ending up in court because everybody's patterns are the same in those conversations. Yeah. I think teaching people there are patterns and they're going to be exploited feels to me like a really important thing. Well, well you know, oh, yeah. I say you know, Harari you says that he would have learned much earlier that he was gay if he had been actually uh, been on Facebook. Oh, wow. It would have uh, spotted him. Because uh, right. uh, the ocean test would have predicted. And oh, wow. So, uh, I mean, I think we will find out we're far more predictable. Uh, uh, well, I'll, you proceed. I just mm. wanted to throw that one out there right. that it's actually, you know, that you can be, it's pretty predictable. Yeah, yeah. That's not what you the one I was thinking That's of. That's not what you were thinking of? No. Uh, <laughs> I guess I, the, the broader question sort of relates to, I think, what you're talking about is this, and it's, if, it, if it's okay to mention Marx for a second, but is yeah. the, the idea of false consciousness. You I mean Groucho? Yeah, the, yeah. The, other, the other Marx, yeah. the other Marx, the other Marx. Um, but just sort of the idea of false consciousness, I think mm. is something that I think we're gonna be reinventing. So the idea that you're right, I think that we do have these, these patterns and these patterns exist and they're sometimes uncomfortable to notice and to see. And I, I, I think a, you know, a cousin to that concept is this idea that we, we have agency and we have choice and we're all you know, floating about the world deciding to do the various things. But there are these sort of structures behind all of that that are showing us particular kinds of music or movies or literature. or mm -hmm. And I can probably have, because the, it's so vast, right? The, um, the number of choices I'm getting is so vast. Mm -hmm. I, it's this, and I, actually, I'm, my old advisor's in the, in the room, actually. This notion between choice and diversity, I think, is mm -hmm. we, uh, something we've talked about a lot, is I think one of the critical issues is that I can have the illusion of choice. There's a whole bunch of choice that I could possibly have. Um, but whether that 
choice is representative of a diversity that I think people need to be able to thrive, to be able hmm. to think differently, to feel differently, to come into different associations with each other, we can get lulled into a sense of false agency or hmm. false consciousness because of the choice. Because Say more of about this, that. What, what, what happens if you go down the wrong path of choice? How does that take you away from? Well, you don't even know it's wrong. Okay. You don't even know it's wrong. Right. I mean, right. you're, you're making... Well, and then it becomes reinforced yeah. because you've made it. So mm. the, I yeah. mean, the psychology of it is that you often, now that I've gone down that path, that must have been the right path. This mm. is the best path to be on. Yeah, and it was right. Or the, or the path that the algorithm suggested. That's the one that I worry yeah. about. But I, I want to push back just a little against this line of argument because yeah. I, think, I think that this is absolutely right when referring to various kinds of consumer choices. I'm not sure it's as right when referring to other kinds of choices um, like particularly what? in the political sphere and mm. in the social sphere and in the work sphere. Um, and the reason I say that is I have seen, you know, one of the things that I, I, the book In the Interest of Others, where we developed the notion of the community of fate, is looking at several different union organizations which are confronting exactly the same problems. They're all in the transport sector. But how they organize themselves and what kinds of choices they then make collectively and what kinds of possibilities they give to their members are very different, mm -hmm. even though there are some patterns there that mm -hmm. are the same. But one set of unions emphasizes only improving the economic well-being and benefits and protections of the workers, and the, which are important and have to be done. And the other one emphasizes that, but also provides a space and a possibility for creating an expanded community of faith for thinking about reciprocal obligations, not only to <coughs> other union people, but also to people way across the world, who, strangers who they'll never meet, hmm. and with whom there can be no, they have no expectation of re reciprocity. To just make that con concrete, a couple, some longshore workers, um, the union on the west coast of the United States has since the 30s voted to close the docks to pay costly, you know, to take, take political and economic hits and maybe even possibly lose their jobs in order to support um, the Chinese who were invaded by the Japanese in 1937 or to refuse to load ships to South Africa mm -hmm. or to to send arsenal to uh, Indone on Indonesian boats that will then be putting, I mean, on Dutch boats that will then be putting down the Indonesian Revolution. So that makes me think that these patterns can be shifted with the right kinds of institutions and organizations. And we can't just, this is, this, I think you're getting into a certain kind of technology think because what you are all mostly addressing is consumers. Hmm. And there are so many other aspects to ourselves that aren't just about, and, and to some extent you're, you're talking about patterns in life, you know, love, marriage, buying cars, buying houses, right. but again, back to consumerism. And there are many other aspects to ourselves which may not be totally individuated, hmm. but which can be structured in very different ways, which is why we talk about platforms for societal collaboration or other kinds of things. Yeah. But there, <clears throat> being the glum Estonian, I'll say that, uh, <laughs> The, uh, there's another side to this too, and that is the uh, uh, the spread of memes that work for bad ideas. Uh, yeah. I mean, I was surprised uh, last uh, autumn to suddenly see this concept of the deep state taking hold in probably one of the thinnest countries in the world in mm. terms of, mm. I mean, you know, we're all two, one or two degrees of. Bake of, of Kevin Bacon away from each other in my right. country, and you know, really, uh, I mean, it's precisely because of digitization, like really, there's there is no deep, there cannot even be a deep state in my country. Yet, you see this alter alt right meme being spread in my country. Right. You see, uh, you see the sort of the Bannon rhetoric is being picked up, and then, uh, and this has been studied by Maya, who is. Not here, maybe, yeah, but anyway. I don't think yeah, she's here. Well, no. I mean, the point is that you have things that work in different places are then picked up for bad ends. So, yeah. we, I mean, so you, yes, good things, yes, 
shared and become broader. But there is always, with with this kind of expansive technology that covers the globe, that you also bad I you know maybe it's Gresham's law when it comes to information. Bad ideas spread pretty fast. Yeah, too. it's interesting. I do, and, and and the distinction you're drawing between consumerism and, and other kinds of organizations, the trouble is. Consumer behavior is what created all of this interest in social media, and that's what's percolating out. So everyone's talking about the yep. Uber of whatever it is, you know, is that same sort of thing. But I would just say one yeah, thing, go I ahead. Mean, that would be the last thing I say. Please. And then I'm, we're going to take some questions yeah. from the audience. But I mean, this, is that I think we have to understand we live in a different era. Yeah. And this is, I think, as fundamental a change as 1452 was for with the invention of movable type, at least in the West, because apparently it was in China before, but anyway. I think that, you know, computers have been around for a while. I mean, to say since the 30s, but as late as the 90s in America, they still, okay, 30% of the population have computers, and the rest of the world far, far less. Um, the, the digital era, I would date as beginning in 2007, roughly, when two things happened. One was the smartphone, which connected everybody and cheaply, so suddenly instead of having a small percentage of the world that was online, suddenly two-thirds of the world is online, and the concurrent decision by Facebook to say, we're going to, you know, we're going to drop, the, well, we'll keep the computer side of this stuff, the laptops up, but we're going to go on to mobile telephones, yeah, right. in which case all of these things became accessible in one form or another to two-thirds to three-quarters right. of the globe. Right. And so this is this has never been seen before, uh, and then to be really sort of to, to push to its glum conclusion, this, uh, this analogy is that it took a lot longer. But basically, what did the invention of movable type do? It led to basically the Thirty Years' War. To this day, at least in percentage terms, the bloodiest war in Europe, mm -hmm. uh, because suddenly people you had this massive spread of well, Lutheran ideology, and people went out to kill them Catholics, mm -hmm. and then they fought back, and then we ended up with that mess. Today, I say, you know, there's such a massive transformation of society through a transformation of available technology, communication technology. It's not a car. It really makes you connect to everybody. Right. And um, I think we have to be far more wary. Yeah, yeah. So for the benefit of the live stream audience, I think we have microphones that can go around. So if, if you have a question for anybody in the panel, throw up a hand, please. Yeah, go ahead, sir. Right here in the black. Hi, Todd Simpson. Uh, first, uh, liquid democracies can have representation. So I think uh, that's an important thing to look into. My question is, uh, democracy relies on an educated citizenry, which you've sort of hinted at. But are we doing enough in that regard uh, where intelligent people might choose not to use some of these technologies? Hmm. That's interesting. Pulling back as a part, of, as a function of education. Go ahead, Mike. Uh, yeah, I would say, I mean, I think there's several pieces to that, but I think the, the ability to opt out, uh, even if you are cognizant of a lot of, at least in the platform world that I'm talking about, it's extremely difficult. I mean, just try for a day to live without touching one of those big five companies that I, li that I listed. Like, even if you can, you're cognizant and you know what it is, try to live your day, I would, I would challenge you. And there's actually uh, some nice uh, stories about people who have tried, and they've actually ended up on criminal watch lists because they look so weird when they do that. <laughs> right. So they actually make themselves look suspicious Why by trying to- Why is she living in the shadows? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, a good, uh, There's a good piece you just tried today that. on this listed. about a woman, I think, who basically, and it wasn't even Facebook. I mean, you can get off Facebook, but try, just try not to use Google right. and try not to use Google Maps. You find out that you know your GPS only uses Google Maps. Um, I mean, you, you, then you, you, get, you don't even know where you are uh, right. when you take an Uber. Uh, so this is, it is very, very difficult. I mean, you, yeah. I would say I also worry that, that you know there's like this this there's now this continuum between people on the one hand who you know have tremendous educations go to preschools where it's all hands on learning you know the Montessori revolution and then there's people you know kids who come home at the end of the day have absolutely nothing else to do but watch YouTube and fall into these unboxing videos is one of these trends that is the most alarming thing in the world uh, you you have a p parents 
who have their child open endless new toys, film them. Uh, the second most watched YouTube star in the world is a six-year-old kid who spends all day opening toys uh, and so that other kids can watch, who, other kids who presumably do not have toys or whatever it is. And you can go down a rabbit hole of thousands of these videos. So for me, the continuum between a kid who, you know, goes to a good school and has tremendous attention at the end of the day, and a kid who goes to a bad school and winds up subject to that kind of stuff, I don't, you know, I think it's But a, there's it's, another it's piece of this. I, I, I take your point on liquid democracy. I was doing it really fast, and so yes, there are forms that have representation. But the issue about education, I think, really has to be interrogated because, ed one, ed good education does not ensure good government. We've had some terribly well-educated people do horrible mm. things mm. Um, or make terrible decisions collectively. And bad education doesn't necessarily lead the other direction. Sometimes it does and sometimes it doesn't. But there's a real question about what kind of education you need to be a good citizen, an engaged citizen. And I think we don't have that education for anybody right now. We have a terrible civics education by any standard. And I don't just mean knowing you know, who the president is or um, you know, the, the, that states have governors. But I mean really thinking about how you would make a good decision as a citizen. And we really, our whole education system in almost every country is very flawed for living in what John Silly Brown calls a white water world, a world that's constantly changing. It's going to be different tomorrow than it is today, and we're trained for one moment, and we haven't been given the skills to adapt, to be able to confront the challenges and the rapids that um, are constantly going to be confronting us. That's right. So we really need a different kind of education, and then we can talk about whether democracy, then democracy temp right. depends on that. Right in the corner here. Well, don't forget Mary Kay over there. Oh, sorry, I didn't see her, but <laughs> go ahead. This gentleman, gentleman, you had your hand up, yeah? Hello. Uh, thanks for a great panel. Um, as in this room, I guess, uh, an ashamed uh, millennial, I have a couple questions related to that that I think you all addressed in a way. Um, Mark, you talked about the way that uh, uh, communication confers ways of relating to one another. I'm curious how you see um, communication uh, affecting the next generation that are so exposed to this current technology. Margaret, you talked about how um, there's a difference between democracy in a true sense and democratization. And so I'm curious how you see this method of communication leading to coherence of some groups at the exclusion of other ones mm -hmm. and what the implications of that are. Excuse me, and then Tom, my third question is, if, if there's gonna be fragmentation of groups as such, how do you regulate pixels um, in civil schemes that are rely on ink, um, so to speak, and how are you going to regulate these micro governance structures um, with traditional civil structures? Mm -hmm. It's, it's three I'll questions. Get it. Yeah, it is three questions. I'm going to throw to Margaret on the, the Generation Z sort of young people. There are people who are working on that here at CASBIS, right. Roberta, <laughs> Roberta, Linda, maybe somewhere in the audience and other folks as well. But um, And I, I confess I'm not as familiar up, up I suggest you that, read the Pacific Standards series that yeah. is just coming out that's mm -hmm. out of our project on this. And that will, that raises a lot of these que questions that you are raising mm -hmm. and addresses them. Yeah. I don't know how you regulate these things at all. I mean, I think they're voluntary and people find a way to where they are. And regulation, what I do see happening, though, is a fragmentation of into three basic systems uh, globally. One is the American laissez-faire um, internet, which, will, which uh, low on protections, but everything goes. And then you have the highly regulated and... Uh, intrusive, especially in terms of privacy system that you see in the PRC and that is being exported to other countries or other countries are interested in, generally more authoritarian ones. And then finally, the European system, which is kind of sluggish, but pays a huge amount of attention to privacy. And uh, how those, I mean, this we're going to see each of these develop in its own way. Um, and you, you can, as you can imagine, <coughs> U.S. will be very innovative, but 
uh, open to abuses. China is becoming increasingly innovative, and, and while well, they don't consider them abusive, and Europe is going to be slow, but you can feel a lot more secure there. Yeah, yeah, that's interesting. Uh, sorry, I don't know who's first. I'm sorry, but Mary Case had her hand Go up. Go right ahead. Feel free. <laughs> Since the beginning. This is good. So this question kind of follows on from what you were just talking about. And first, thanks for a really thought-provoking conversation amongst all of you. Um, so, so Mike, you asked a couple of important questions. What kinds of governance of these systems is possible? And what principles should drive the public governance of these systems? And you know, if you look at China, where I was a foreign correspondent for a few years and where I lived, um, you know, they already have the vast majority of the population on WeChat where they're gather gathering all kinds of information on the population. There's currently China's Belt and Road Initiative to build out physical infrastructure in almost 70 countries to move the center of gravity of global trade to China, but there's also a digital Belt and Road. And it's to export, as Tom was saying, many of the technologies, including surveillance technologies that China's already using. So I guess the question is, if the, the principles that different entities have in mind about what our shared future should be, hmm. you know, does this, do we just battle it out? Because I don't really hmm. see this being you know, sort of segregated systems. I yeah. think everyone's going to be competing to try to dominate with their vision of what the technological future should be. Hmm. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I, was, I, I had the pleasure and luck of being with some senior Canadian officials last week uh, thinking through this question and sort of thinking about the world as being in some different um, uh, sectors or, or areas. And so, so the UK just came out with their duty of care standard. Yeah, yesterday's, today, Tuesday, yes, mm -hmm. yesterday, uh, duty of care. Thinking about that as a principle for platform regulation, which sort of, in a nutshell, it says, you know, we don't let restaurants operate unless their kitchens are clean, unless they are serving food that passes a health code. We don't let hotels operate if they don't have, you know, you can't have stairs that are falling down or, you know, beds that are breaking or stuff. So there's this duty of care idea that when you create an environment or a context. And so they're bringing that as sort of a broad overarching principle to the to the to the core and, say, and arguing against sort of the, an American marketplace model uh, explicitly of saying that. Um, the other one that's sort of popping up in uh, David Kay, who is the UN Special Rapporteur on, um, on platforms basically, is, has been developing with a bunch of other folks, but a human rights framework. So that's, that's a very different logic or, or organizing principle for thinking about how to regulate um, these, these groups. But, and then the other bit, and I, I especially heard this from the, from the Canadians, is sort of this recognition that you know, there is, there's a, an, a very strong American model, there's a very strong Chinese model, and then there's, you know, this <laughs> emerging EU one, and then there's sort of this other category of like all the other folks who are sort of uh, having to grapple with and, and are still sort of caught up in these nets of platforms. So the question is sort of do those folks organize themselves into sort of an alternative, and what's the organizing principle that you should do that under? Is it a human rights framework? Is it a duty of care? Is it information fiduciary is another model that's talked about? But these are, so these are, I think what I see right now is a bunch of jurisdictions and, and you might say communities of faith, but are sort of arguing about or trying to grapple with what should be our organizing principles and from there, we can talk about the kinds of regulations that might be both effective and feasible, right? Because mm -hmm. you need to, that effectiveness and feasibility have to be sort of come hand in hand. But I think we're, that's where we are. I'll just today. throw in here that I was at a dinner the other night of a bunch of mid-level tech uh, people and, and, and they were learning for the first time at this about the Sesame credit system, the Chinese social credit mm -hmm. system that collects all the data on you and then makes decisions about what you get to do in the country based on how well you've been behaving mm -hmm. online and in real life. And there were two amazing things about it. One, um, when we were asking, okay, what, you know, how, how within your organizations do you arrive at ethical lines, uh, there was no cohesive answer. Everybody said, well, my standards might be a little different than my managers or somebody else, but I know where I stand, so I'm good. But there was no cohesion in terms of, of the organization. And the other amazing thing was that half of the, I don't know about if it was exactly half, but anecdotally from the people I spoke to, half of the people thought the Chinese Sesame credit system was appalling, and the other half thought it was incredibly awesome and should be somehow pursued and worked into their work. So there's no cohesive structure for creating a system of values, and people's values are in some cases split perfectly opposite within American companies right now. So what are we going to do about that? I don't know. I think we got time for, oh, sorry, I was going to say we got one more, but go, go ahead. Go ahead. All right, to you. All right one more. Uh, who's, who's left? 
right there in the, in the back, Federico. And then you'll have time to besiege all of us uh, during Boy, the break. Put me on the spot here. Go um, ahead. Last one. Um, so uh, I'm a pretty young guy. Um, I've never owned a copy of Robert's Rules. Um, I know it used to be a pretty big bestseller. Um, I think on the internet, the Robert's Rule is basically like put on a name tag and start screaming. Mm -hmm. um, every single website you've probably ever used, you were just offered a blank white box with a submit button. There's no formatting or structuring you can do to say what what kind of information is this? What kind of conversation do I want to be engaged in? And I'm wondering um, when you think about Robert's rules or how do you how do you just have the basic framework for talking about anything important? To, to, you know, not even getting to the level of democracy, but you know, what do we eat for dinner or something like this? We have these sophisticated systems of chits and points that we can allocate, but we don't even have a basic framework for like what. What kind of statement am I making here? Mm. And I hate to sound, um, if any of the big five are listening, please plug your ears or anyone who works at them. I don't want to give you an idea, but it strikes me we might be able to solve this problem um, with that technology by saying, you know, if they're all data hungry, the idea that we can code in what kind of data we're actually giving them to begin with and have the benefit that it structures our conversation in such a way that we can start building upon each other or challenging each other and it's immediate and, and sort of expected behavior, a sort of digital Robert's rules. Have any of you encountered any groups that are attempting to sort of distance ourselves from the generic screaming pit that is the empty white box and hit, you know, go? And I don't just mean thumbs up, thumbs down, like, okay, whatever, binary system, but do you see anyone trying to make inroads into structuring conversation differently? You know, you talked about the um, predictability and I agree, is it, is it that we're predictable or is it the frameworks are so limited and we're, we're all making the same 10 choices because those are just the structural right, choices we both, can make? Right. The same idea, is, are, you know, if it's just this blank box we're all yelling into, you know, of course are we just gonna start yelling and not understanding each mm -hmm. other? Has anybody yeah, encountered yeah. Things, systems that make you hopeful? Well, so one of the things, as I mentioned, I was at this Radical Exchange uh, conference in Detroit and among the many people who were there were some Detroit community representatives who were working on problems of data justice. And by the data justice, they meant not only um, protecting themselves against ways in which the companies and the platforms were invading their privacy or affecting their decision making, but it was also to establish conversations and ways in which um, civility could be used and protected so that people could argue with each other internally in order to come to some decision or discussion about things that were going on that were affecting them or that they wanted to affect. Mm -hmm. So I think there are small experiments going on all over the place and it would, be, it would behoove us to pay attention to them and to learn from them and to build on them. Yeah. Well, I'm short of... Um 124, by, one, by 124 followers of 100,000 people on Twitter. Anyone wants to sign up? <laughs> no, <you're right>. But <laughs> I have not been trolled, I think, in all that time by anyone who appears under their own name. Sometimes people have been snarky, but the nastiness is only from the 95% of people who are there under, who are there pseudonymously. Whereas, uh, I mean, I people who write under their own name tend to be civil. This is part of the anonymity problem, which is that when, you, when, you, when you're there under your own name, it's you and you don't really want to be a jerk. Whereas if you're there under you know, whatever you want to call yourself, you can say anything you want. And that certainly, I think, is a, is a, sort of, is a certain form of sort of civilizing behavior, <laughs> being you. I, I'd also throw in, um, and with, with Mako Hill in the room, I, I hesitate to do so necessarily, but I think Wiki, Wikipedia is an interesting example of a, there's, there's large gender inequalities, there's geographic inequalities, there's problems with Wikipedia for sure, but that's you know, a place where there's a lot of grappling with what the governance of a page looks like, what good or bad editors look like, what good or bad edits look like. Uh, Stuart Geiger, who's at Berkeley, has done some really nice work sort of looking at the social dynamics of Wikipedia edits, and I think that's a promising yeah. uh, area. Yeah. Well, you guys will have, certainly we'll stick around for a little while to talk to anybody else who wants to, but let's give our panel a big hand, please.
Thanks so much for coming. Really appreciate it.